Good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? So, now that the smoke is cleared on UDFA, I think we can now do our day three recap. Uh, obviously, the meat of the action came from the actual draft, but I did want to wait to see who some of the more interesting UDFAs would be. I went over all the undrafted free agency stuff in the video this morning that I uploaded a couple hours ago, but uh, I'll, I'll briefly summarize the more interesting stuff as part of this video. The guys who I actually think have a chance to stick, but we're going to lead off with the draft picks because um, there were some really interesting draft picks that we made in the last four rounds of the draft. So, um, obviously, day three encompasses rounds four, five, six, and seven. We ended, ended up making five selections. We traded down once in order to pick up an extra one. And with the way things broke, it was actually probably really good that we did that because we got a guy with the extra pick that we knew from before the draft the team was valuing. But um, we'll get to that in a minute here. So day three, first pick early in the fourth round was uh, Cincinnati Bearcat cornerback Kobe Bryant. He was a guy I was talking about as a potential Seahawks target months and months ago. As I looked more into him closer to the draft, I saw a lot of things that I liked. I saw a couple things that put me off him a little bit. But I think this is actually a relatively safe pick. I think Kobe Bryant will make a clear and defined impact in the NFL. Um, which, which contrasts him with the next guy we're going to talk about. But Kobe Bryant, to me, I, I did scout him in my in my uh, pre-draft uh, cornerback look. I he, He's a very productive player. He had five years at Cincinnati. The first year, he basically didn't play. But over the last four seasons, he's basically been a full-time starter. Uh, played across from Sauce Gardner, was basically the uh, Byron Maxwell to Sauce Gardner's Richard Sherman. Um, had over 165 tackles, five for loss, nine interceptions, including four in 2020, 35 passes defensed, four forced fumbles, a lot of experience, a lot of production, part of some really good Bearcat defenses. Excuse me. Um, this guy did a lot of stuff. The issues that I noted with him when I scouted him were he needs to become a better tackler. The effort is there but he needs to become a little better at it, and his arms are a little bit shorter. But that's kind of interesting in and of itself that we were willing to take a corner whose arms are like 30 and a half inches. So the thing with Kobe Bryant to me is that I don't know if he's ever going to be a star in the NFL, but I think he's going to have some kind of impact. I think that whenever his career in Seattle is over, We'll be able to look back and identify plays that he made and times when he was on the field for significant portions of games. Um, there, there have certainly been a lot of Seattle draft picks over the years where we draft a guy and then he never really gets on the field. I don't think Kobe Bryant is at any risk of being one of those guys. I think he might even be starting by the end of his rookie year because he's so experienced from college. Uh, okay. So that was good. I gave the Kobe Bryant pick a B plus. I think it's really good. Maybe just shy of great, but I, I think it's a really good pick and makes sense. It addresses a clear need, and it gives us a guy who I think can play as a rookie. But one thing that makes the Kobe Bryant pick better is what we did in the fifth round, and I never thought we would be able to pull this off, Tariq Woolen cornerback from the University of San Antonio, University of Texas, San Antonio. Um, <clears throat> this guy, I, I, I will confess that unlike Kobe Bryant, he has great bust potential. He could be nothing in the NFL. He could be like a Therold Simon. He could be, he, he might never play a snap for us. It's possible. But unlike the third round, where I wanted to take Tariq Woolen, I would have been fine with taking him in the third round. That would have actually kind of been a gamble. Getting him in the fifth round like we did, there is no gamble. Go look at our drafts over the last nine to ten years. Look at the fifth round picks that we've made who never did anything. 
Look at the fourth round picks that we've made that never did anything. <laughs> it, it, the, every other year it felt like we were taking a guy in the fourth round who ended up giving us nothing. And I don't mean nothing like LJ Collier or nothing like Kristen Michael. I'm talking nothing like John Ursua. I'm talking literally just nothing. Nothing like Chris Harper. Nothing like... Uh, <sighs> We took so many fourth-round receivers who never even saw the field. So what if I told you that in the fourth, fifth round this year, we drafted a guy who might give us nothing but has 6'4 size at cornerback, 4.26 40 time, one of the fastest 40 times ever recorded, and in the happy path could be the next Richard Sherman. No no joke, no exaggeration. He's got a lot to work on. He played receiver for three years. He switched to cornerback in 2020. At the position of cornerback, he has like less than 40 career, uh, I'm sorry, less than 60 career tackles, five for loss, a sack and a half, two interceptions, nine passes defensed. He's very raw. There's no doubt about it. I don't expect this guy to play as a rookie. If he never gets on the field significantly, it wouldn't surprise me at all. But there remains tremendous upside. And if you remember, we got Richard Sherman in the fifth round. This stuff does happen. Now, Sherman's numbers in college were better than Tariq Woolen's, but Woolen has Sherman's size, and he's significantly faster. And if anybody can figure this stuff out, it's Carroll. If Carroll figures this out, out with Woolen who I do think at the very least will be a very good zone cornerback in the NFL, if I had to guess, watch out. You have yourself an all-pro caliber cornerback. I don't want to exaggerate things too much, but this pick is an A+. I would have been cool with him in the third. You got him in the fifth. Like, that is just... I can't say anything bad about that. So, awesome pick there. Uh, next in the fifth round... Uh, this was the pick we got after we traded down, I think. We ended up with a Tyreek Smith, defensive end from Ohio State. Uh, he was somebody I scouted. So I'm kind of mixed on Tyreek Smith. To me, he's a good fit for a hybrid defense because he can do cover stuff. He can He can play in coverage. He can play standing up. So that's good. But at the end of the day, at Ohio State, he just wasn't very productive. He was a guy who got decent pressure numbers. But if you look at the actual stats, uh, his only significant year was 2021, 26 tackles, 5 for loss, 3 sacks. So you don't have anything you can point to and say he he um, he put up big numbers. And he, granted, he did play at a big school like Ohio State. They're, they're making big bowl games pretty much every year. But I just don't see the big impact. I saw a guy with a very messy pass rush repertoire. Um, I, I think it was uh, Brandon on the Hawks Nest. He put it together like he would have a hard time committing to a pass rush move. He would be just like dancing back and forth between three different moves when you should just be committing because by the time you actually get around your guy, the quarterback's going to have the ball out of his hands probably by a, by a wide margin. But um, it's not a bad pick. He is a good fit for a hybrid defense. Um I can easily see him having a path to contribute as like a fourth uh, edge rusher. And he does give you the flexibility of being able to play in coverage as an outside linebacker. Um, next up is Bo Melton, wide receiver from Rutgers. He was a guy, he was the only guy we drafted that I did not scout. I don't know a lot about Bo Melton or, well, I should say I didn't know much about Bo Melton before the draft. So um, I had a few people in the chat who actually really liked him. Uh, I had a couple people actually tell me his name in the mock draft simulations I did. Some people were actually up on him. Um, smaller guy, 5'11", 195 pounds. Apparently, he was very highly recruited coming out of college, but decided to go to Rutgers. It's not clear why, but that's part of the reason why he ended up going in the 7th. Uh, uh, some people think that he should have been a 5th rounder, so the value's there, so that's good. And the main thing about Bo Melton is that he's a speedster. I think his 40 time was 4.33. Uh, he had four pretty productive years um, um, at, at Rutgers, including the last three. 
where he was particularly productive, had um, over 130 catches, had pretty um, pretty nice yards production, over 1,500 yards, 11 touchdowns, also got in some work as a running back, had 25 carries over the last four years for Rutgers. Um, I, I think there is some potential here for this guy to actually make the team, even though we're a little crowded at receiver, partially because... A lot of people think Bo Melton will end up being a return man as well in the NFL. He didn't do it a lot in college, though. He has 16 career special teams returns over the last two seasons. But some people think Bo Melton will latch on as a return man. I would love that. Um, Taking your key guys off the field on kick and punt returns is a big deal to me. I don't want our primary receivers... Like, even a Dwayne Eskridge. Like, with what's going on with Dwayne Eskridge, do you feel good putting him back there as a uh, a return man? I kind of don't. Um, obviously, the Tyler Lockett thing, that the him as a return man, that, that ship is long sailed. You can't do that really anymore. And um, we, maybe Trey Brown could do it, but he's going to have a big role to play on the defense, and he's coming off a major injury. So if it could be somebody like a Bo Melton who has the speed to do it and did it a little bit in college, that's a way he can get on the field immediately and make a positive impact. That's one thing I really like about this class. There's not really a lot of guys who I look at and go, oh, that guy will never do anything. And again, when I say never do anything, I mean in the way John Orsua never did anything, in the way that Chris Harper never did anything. Uh, Some of these guys might not do much more for us than Nazir Jones or uh, Jordan Hill, but at least that's something. I don't think any of these guys are going to be down at the level of, like, the Chris Harpers. So that's good. Uh, Final draft pick, this was a middle seventh round pick, was Derek Young. This guy was somebody that I did scout because the Seahawks visited with him and were clearly very interested. Lenore Ryan, uh, I think the Bears... Lenore Ryan Bears. Interesting player. He's 6'2", ran like a sub 4.440, so he's got a good combo of size and speed. Um, the notable thing about him is the Debo potential. And it's become very trendy for teams to try to find the next Debo. Like, uh, there were quite a few players in the uh, draft where the draft analysts were like, uh, oh, He's the next Debo. Oh, he's the next, uh, um, uh, can he do the stuff that Debo does in terms of being a wide back, right? Wide receiver and running back. And uh, we know Debo's gotten kind of sick of doing that because it's going to shorten his career. But um, a guy like uh, Derek Young, who will be lucky to just have a career, he's not going to have any particular objections to it. And if you look at his size and speed and what he did in college, he really could do it. Um from 2018 to 2019, he actually got over 85 carries as a back in the Lenore Ryan offense for 650 yards and eight touchdowns. There was one year where he was a more prolific running back than a wide receiver. So if you're looking at Lenore uh, Derek Young and trying to figure out what he could do for Seattle, it's that Debo role. And I, I give him a chance. This is not, to me, somebody who's likely to never do anything for us because he does have that upside, because the team clearly was interested in him pre-draft. And as a receiver, he had some pretty decent years. 2019 was probably his best overall year. 25 catches, 500 yards, 8 touchdowns. So that year he gave you almost 900 yards from scrimmage and 12 touchdowns. Very productive that one year. Again, he's playing really weak competition, but his measurables stack up. So, Derek Young, I give him a chance. I do. Um, guys like Penny Hart haven't really done anything to impress us at the NFL level yet. I like Kay Johnson, but maybe he never does it. I like Aaron Fuller, but he's been around for a while and hasn't done anything yet. So, guys like Derek Young, who, by the way, a lot of people thought Derek Young was going to be maybe a fifth-round pick. You get him in the seventh round, and you're saying... I feel like this guy has a shot to contribute. That's pretty good. So, to me, both seventh-round picks are uh, A-. minus. We got good value, and we got guys who I can easily see contributing in some capacity. Uh, 
Um, the the only pick that I was a little down on was Tyreek Smith, and I'd still give it like a C. So overall, day three, I, I think I would be giving it something like an A minus. Um, it, it it's really good. I I think that there are better routes we could have gone with the Tyreek Smith pick. Like I think uh, Damone Clark was still there, but. One thing we learned from this draft process was that teams were not messing around with guys with major health flags, right? Like if, if you as a player have a massive injury or reason to believe that your career has been shortened in some way, they're not messing with you. Carson Strong undrafted. Damone Clark falls to the back of the fifth. Uh, Nakobe Dean fell all the way to the back end of the third. So... Guys like that, clearly teams are just deciding, you know what, we're not going to mess with you right now. So, overall, I think the draft is an A. Maybe an A-, minus, but I'd give it an A. We got two A-plus picks in my mind. We got a couple of A picks in my mind. And no bad picks. The only guy in this draft class who I look at and kind of instinctively go oh, that guy's never going to do anything for us, would be Tyreek Smith. And I don't even really think that's super likely because at least as a rookie, he's probably going to be our second edge rusher off the bench behind Mafe. It's going to be Taylor Nwosu and then Mafe and Smith off the bench. So he's probably going to at least play some. It's not going to be like a, a Chris Harper situation where he just never plays for us. Okay, um, UDFAs that I think actually have a chance at sticking. I already went over this in the video earlier, but for those of you who missed it, I'll go over it here real quick. Five Seahawks UDFAs that I think have a shot here. Shamarius Gilmore would be my number one. He's an interior offensive lineman, almost 300 pounds, 6'3". I don't know if he's going to be a guard or center, but he has five years of experience at uh, Georgia State. And the notable thing about him is that he did like 36 bench reps of 225, which is a lot. And he's got good agility. So you're looking at Shamarius Gilmore and you're you're thinking to yourself, you know, we, we have a needed guard. We don't, we're not great at guard right now. Um, Phil Haynes and Damian Lewis have a chance. But Gabe Jackson's got one year in Seattle left probably, and then he's gone. And past that, it, it's anybody's game. So Shamarius Gilmore... Um, I would predict that he at least makes the practice squad as of right now, and he will absolutely have a chance to make this roster after Gabe Jackson is gone, which, by the way, could happen this offseason still. So, very intriguing guy. Combination of strength and agility is very notable. I, I liked this one has really grown on me since we made the signing. Deontay Williams, safety from Nebraska. He was a guy I thought we might pick in like the, maybe even the fifth but definitely the seventh. Very surprised he went undrafted. Um, I I scouted this guy out a little bit. Um, he's got the NFL size. He had two pretty solid years for Nebraska the last two seasons. About 100 tackles, six for loss, a sack, four interceptions in 2021. Became a nice little ball hawk. We have a need at safety behind Jamal and Diggs. And... I don't know who our safety depth is going to be. We didn't draft any, obviously. Amadi can do it. Blair can do it. But I don't know if that's where we see those guys. And obviously, Blair is very injury prone. I um, don't know if Amadi is going to be here either, by the way. I'm, I'm not a big fan of his right now. And I don't know if we're going to bring back guys like Josh Jones and Tanner Muse or even uh, Nigel Warrior, guys that I'm interested in. But um, there's no guarantee they're here. Um, Bubba Bolden would be the other safety that I think has a good chance of actually sticking. I, I think that one of these two guys, Deontay Williams or Bubba Bolden, will end up on the practice squad at least, if not the 53-man. Bubba Bolden actually played at two major schools, USC Miami and um, Miami, Florida. Um, 6'3", 204 pounds, so he's got the NFL size. Very productive last two years at Miami. Only one interception, but... Uh, as a strong safety, he shows real potential. Over 100 tackles over the last two years. 10 for loss, 2 sacks. A lot of plays made in the backfield. Uh, there are a lot of safeties that we brought in that I think have a chance. There's the um, um, Blunt guy from Virginia. There was the uh, Wisconsin guy, I think. 
I think any of them have a chance, but I think that Deontay and Bubba Bolden are clubhouse leaders to actually stick on the roster in some capacity. So keep an eye on those two guys when rookie minicamp start up next week. Uh, Caleb Ellaby is the quarterback who I think could could um, actually be on this team for longer than just the rookie minicamp because uh, he just got tryout. But I look at Lewis, Levi Lewis, and I see a guy who's just too small. It, it's almost hard to take seriously because he's 180 pounds. He's like a smaller version of Matt Coral, which Matt Coral is um, small himself. Uh, Western Michigan guy, had a pretty good year in 2021. 3,300 yards, 23 touchdowns, 6 interceptions. I will grant you that Levi Lewis is a little more fun because he's a lefty. But Caleb Ellaby, he, he just looks more like an NFL quarterback to me. He was also Eskridge's quarterback for part of Eskridge's college career. Um, this guy's only getting a tryout, but I think that if we carry four quarterbacks, he could be the fourth one very easily because we didn't draft a quarterback. Uh, final guy, the fifth guy, and this guy I see mostly as a special teamer, but I'm including him just because he's very close to having the size that makes sense for a, an interior linebacker in the NFL. 6'1", 234 pounds. You could see an interior linebacker in the NFL in a 3'4 who weighs 235. It's not ridiculous, right? It's uh, probably 5 to 10 pounds off of what you would like, but it's close. He's also a little shorter than you would like, but it's not by some massive amount. Uh, there were some uh, linebackers that we picked up who I immediately just dismissed as having a chance of playing on defense because they're too small. Avery Roberts is close, and as a Beaver last year, he was actually extremely productive. 123 tackles, 9.5 for loss, 2.5 sacks, a pick, a forced fumble, two passes defensed. He, he, he did his thing. And he was also really good in 2019 as well. Six and a half tackles for loss, two sacks. I think that Avery Roberts could stick as a special teamer. Um, BBK is coming off a major injury. Maybe this is a guy who can replace BBK. Um, we do have some need at linebacker. So I, I give Avery Roberts a decent chance of making an impact. And uh, that's it for this uh, day three in my estimation. Those are the guys to watch. I've really liked our draft picks. Uh, UDFA could have been better, but we did get a couple guys who have uh, gotten my attention. So I'm going to go ahead and call that a W. And it was a W draft. It was a great draft. I'm really excited about the direction this team is going, going into 2022. I have hope. I think the front office is finally doing things the right way. Hopefully we can maintain it if we can just uh, stick to the path. I think that by 2023, we can be good again, and 2024, we can be competing for titles again. We just have to get this right. Um, don't worry about the quarterback right now. Obviously, we've already kind of committed to having a mediocre at best quarterback this year, whoever it may be, Geno, Locke, Baker. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that later, but um, I, I, I think that um, it, it's the right thing to do. Get the quarterback next year. And this year, we're just going to try to get everything in place for him. All right, that's day three. Wrapped it up. See you guys later today. There are going to be more videos. But um, that's going to do it for this one. Let me know what you guys thought of day three. Keep an eye out for me on Twitch today. Going live with the Hawks Nest to talk about day three tonight over on his channel. See you guys there. And go Hawks.